Hi, I'm Magda. I'm a non-native speaker. I teach military English to soldiers. And today I would like to tell you a little bit about how to understand native speakers better. I would like to share my experience, but also tell you what are some tricks, some techniques that you can use to understand them better. So let's get started. Today we are going to talk about connected speech and that's going to be like number one topic today uh, because I truly consider it to be the secret sauce in all of this equation of understanding native speakers. Then we're going to talk about IPA, schwa and silent letters in some English words. Then about slang and jargon, regional accents and exposure bad speaking habits, exam listening and the goals of exam listenings. And we'll end up, I will end up giving you some tricks, some tips uh, on what you can do in order to start working on your understanding, on your listening skills right now, today, if you wish. All right, so I would like to open up with a, with a little joke. So like in every entertainment program. And I would I'm not going to read it to you. I would like you to read it by yourself in your mind or out loud if that would help and see if you can get this joke. I'm going to come back to this joke at the end of this webinar, but let's see if you can get it now. Did you get it? It might help to read it one more time and also read it out loud. Okay, I'm not going to explain it because the joke loses uh, all of the fun when it's explained. So let's move on. I'm going to start with some features of connected speech. So connected speech is the way native speakers connect words, obviously, and it makes it sound natural, relaxed. Some of my students refer to it as relaxed speech or fast speech. And it, it sounds like it's just flowing naturally, like effortless. And it's the way native speakers speak like in the chunks of not separating every single word but speaking in the chunks like in the blocks of words together the first thing to mention should be contractions so native speakers use contractions and it's important to know how they are pronounced so here we have some basic ones just to, to start off because we, we are going to dig deeper today uh, and discuss some phonetic, phonetics and phonology terms. So I wanted to start with something simple. Uh, I'll, his, I. Okay, this is the way we pronounce those contractions. Uh, Later on today, we're going to talk about informal contractions. So all of the things that you hear in the slang informal language movies to wanna, gonna, ain't, kinda, uh, and this type of informal contractions. But I wanted to start with something very simple. So the way we pronounce those classic contractions. I'll, his, I. Okay, one of the things, one of the mechanisms that happens is intrusion. This is when we add an extra sound to our speech. For example, go away. There is an extra w go away. It's not go away, it's go away. Just do it, do it. Not do it, but do it, just do it. 
Yes, we are. We are. We don't say we are, but we add this sound. We are. Yes, we are. Some things to this, like some new sounds are being created when the letter T and the letter Y meet. The sound that comes out of this meeting is T. For example, I won't let you, I won't let you would sound like I won't let you, I won't let you, I won't let you go, I won't let you. Okay. And the second sentence, I met your friend would be pronounced, is more likely to be pronounced as, I met your friend, I met your friend, met your, met your. This is probably more common example. This one you can hear quite a lot. So when the letter D and the letter Y meet, we'd pronounce it more like J. I need your help would be pronounced as, I need your help. I need your help. How could you would be pronounced as how could you? How could you? Did you go is more likely to be pronounced in connected speech as did you go? Did you go? Did you go? Did you? In the British English, um, well, I, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this video that I'm going to be talking mostly about American English in this video, although I wanted to mention some aspects that are very characteristic to British English. For example, adding an extra R between some words. Let's take a look at those words. And I'm going to try to pronounce it the way British people pronounce it, although I'm not focused on learning British accent. Uh, law and order, law and order. Australia and England. Media event. The art is there, but it's very subtle. But it's there. It's called an intrusive R in British English. And as, it, as the slide says, it's between two vowels and it makes it sound smoother, the transition between those. Well, it does, they don't have to be vowels they, um, in the transcription. They can be like sounds. Okay, weak forms. So we haven't talked yet about content words and function words in English. So content words are the words that carry the meaning like nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, while function words are words like prepositions, articles, determiners, this kind of short words uh, that usually carry some grammatical meaning. And in the weak forms, when we use like the function words, those words can have both full form and a weak form. So when they are in the sentence, in the connected speech, they become weak forms. Let's take a look at uh, the word and. If Let's imagine the, the conversation that we are having with someone. So your friend is telling you a story and then he or she stops and you say and, right? Like inviting this person to, to continue. This is a full form. We don't reduce anything here, right? But if we use this word in a sentence, then we do reduce it to an sound. Let's take a look at those examples. Bed and breakfast. Bed and, bed and breakfast. Fish and chips. Fish and chips. Okay. Can you hear that it's different than full and? Okay, so it also depends on the context in which you're using this word, if you're using it as a full form or as a weak form. Then same thing happens, uh, although the word off would only be pronounced like in a full form 
at the end of a sentence uh, when we want to emphasize it. For example, what does it consist of, right? Then we pronounce of in this way, that when it's in the middle of the sentence, it will always be reduced. A cup of coffee, a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, a cup, sorry for the noises from the street. I don't know if you can hear them, but sorry. Um, half. When it's in a sentence, like between other verbs, like in this case, we would pronounce it as of. You should have told me. You should have told me. Okay. We don't say you should have told me, but you should have told me. You should have. It will really help if you repeat after me while you're watching this webinar. Okay, sometimes we skip a sound at the end of the word. This is called a lesion, when a consonant sound is left out. And it happens usually with T's or D's. It's my handbag, right? I'm not pronouncing this D at the end. Or the girl next door, next door, not next door but next door handbag my handbag the girl next door another process that happens in connected speech is assimilation when the final consonant is modified by a subsequent consonant for example in this expression mashed potatoes okay so in general we would reduce mashed to mashed, right? Like not, we don't pronounce it as the ED, obviously, but then it gets assimilated with the next consonant, P, mashed potatoes, right? We don't even pronounce this T, it's just mashed potatoes. And sometimes we just simply link the words together. So we don't separate them as two separate words, but they just become like one long word. This is what happens in the linking. Scramble eggs, scramble eggs, right? Like not scrambled eggs, but scramble eggs, as if it was one long word. Okay, so that was about uh, connected speech. And there are many other aspects of connected speech to talk about, but I want to keep it short. And if you want to dig deeper, I encourage you to do that. You can find lots of videos on YouTube about connected speech and analysis of certain speeches. That's a fantastic way to learn certain mechanisms and imitate and shadow those speakers. But now I would like us to talk about IPA, schwa and silent letters. So these are some of the things that it's good to be aware of and get familiar with if you want to improve your pronunciation but also listening skills because often these two things go together okay so a lot of people when they see the word ipa they automatically think about indian pale ale right this is how it's called um the type of beer but that's not what we're going to talk about today IPA is International Phonetic Alphabet. Getting familiar with IPA will really help you work on the way you sound, but also to understand other speakers of English. It's going to make a huge difference just getting familiar with those sounds, digging deeper in that. I know that this the pronunciation aspect is quite neglected at schools and we are not taught it in a proper way or not at all and often we have to do this research on our own so i encourage you to to do that to get into that and kind of get interested in that because it's really fascinating like the more you learn about it the more fascinating it gets and it will pay off 
Ah, coming back to, to this. So these are all of these funny letters that you can see in the dictionary. Um, so yeah, now you know that what are those letters because they always appear next to the, the words. And all of the sounds that exist in all the languages are represented there in the International Phonetic Alphabet. English has some sounds that are represented there, so it's it's not that English owns International Phonetic Alphabet. As the name suggests, it's international, so other languages have different sounds and different representations of those sounds, and they also exist there. But here, like learning English, you should focus on the ones that exist in English. You can also compare them with the ones in your native language that could help to, to be aware that certain sounds simply don't exist in your native language. That's why you might be struggling to pronounce them in English. So you need to learn those sounds. You need to teach your mouth like how to make those sounds. You need to create the muscle memory in order to be able to use them freely in a conversation. Ah, speaking about international phonetic alphabet, there is a sound in English that is the most common vowel sound, and that's a schwa. It's so common that it even got a proper name. Other sounds don't have their names. It's what schwa has. So schwa earned the status of the vowel that has its proper name. Um, being aware of the existence of schwa is like the first step of understanding what is really happening in the American pronunciation, but not only in the American one, it exists in all of the dialects of English. The schwa sound is found in unstressed syllables of content words. I know it might sound very technical, but it's actually very simple. We talked about content words what are they? That they're the ones that carry the meaning, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. So every word has a, in English has a primary stress. This is the one that when we speak, we raise a little bit when we on this syllable. For example, the word engineer, right? Like we raise like on the last syllable. It's not engineer, it's engineer, the last one. This is the one that is stressed. And what happens with long words in English, uh, especially the ones that are a bit longer, there are some syllables that are unstressed. And those syllables are very likely to adopt, like to use a schwa in them. We're going to take a look at some of the examples, so it will be clearer after I show you some. And schwa is also very common in function words used in connected speech, as we talked about the word for, uh, of, right? When they are used in a connected speech, they're often reduced to a schwa as well. Okay, and here are some examples of words that you can hear schwa in. As, as you can see, schwa can represent different English vowels, right? It can be a, it could be O, it could be U, E, and other vowels too, and diphthongs. So this is what happens. Let's pronounce the, those words. Ah, first of all, how do we pronounce this sound? So what you need to do, you need to really relax your mouth. The position of your mouth should be almost, this, should be actually the same as you have when you're when your mouth is closed, when you're resting, okay? So then, in order to make the schwa sound, you slightly open your mouth and you make this sound. Uh. That's it. That's the most relaxed sound that exists. You don't have to involve your vocal cords, like you don't have to make any special effort, just open your mouth and say oh. and that's it okay let's try to say those words that we have listed here about about 
right? It's not about, not about, mm -mm. it's about. The next word is a bit longer. And as you can see, we have two words that are schwas here. Photography. Photography. It's not photo, gra, gra right? This sub, these sounds are reduced. What is the syllable that we stress here? Photography. Photo, photography. So this one cannot be reduced, right? Because it's stressed. If a syllable is stressed, it cannot be reduced ever. Photography. So ta cannot be reduced. But our syllables can be, right? And they are. Photography. Phot phot photography. Graphy. Graphy. I'm repeating it to make you hear that um, we we are sometimes deceived by what we see because we see the letter O and we want to pronounce it. We see the letter A and we want to pronounce it, but we are not supposed to. We are supposed to reduce them to a schwa. Photography, photography. Then the next word, we see the letter U and we want to pronounce it because this is that's what happens like when we learn the language, like we see the letters. And also um, in many languages, the, the, um, the way we write the word is the same the way we pronounce it, the way we hear it. This is what happens in Polish. This is what happens in Spanish, like in most of the dialects and most of the sounds of Spanish. But that's not what happens in English. So here we have the word submit, submit submit and finally the last one tiger 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 it's not tiger it's tiger and now we're going to take a look at some words that are also military ranks and funny thing all the military ranks contain schwas you can find a schwa in every single military rank. I think that I checked all of them and they were in all of them. But if there is like one that maybe I've missed, let me know. But I think they are in all of them. So we've got the word sergeant, sergeant, gent, gent, right? So here these two sounds are reduced to a schwa, sergeant. Then we have the next word that is actually a really challenging one to pronounce, kernel, kernel. Hmm? So here, the last vowel is reduced. Let's hear it one more time. Kernel. Next. This word is pronounced differently in British and in American English. Uh, here we have the American phonetic transcription of it. Lieutenant, Lieutenant. Okay, so here the stress is on T, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, right, Lieutenant. And the last syllable is in stressed and it's reduced to schwa. Uh, next, Corporal, Corporal. Here we have again two vowels that are reduced to a schwa. And the last one, general, general. Again, two vowel sounds reduced to a schwa. And you can see here in the corner, schwa, just chilling, sitting in an armchair, doing nothing, being relaxed, not stressed at all, because schwa is never stressed. Remember, the syllable that contains a schwa is never stressed. So schwa is always relaxed, okay, it's there. So this is how I want you to think about this sound in English. Relaxed, chilling, okay, not stressed at all. Let's play a little game. Let's make it a little bit more interactive, entertaining. 
I would like you to try, you can pause the video, and I would like you to try to read these words. Okay, so pause the video, and I'm going to read these words right now, so let's hear that. Uh, the first one that is on the right, upright, officer, officer. Here we have the schwa in the middle. Okay, and like schwa aspiring sound uh, at the end. Then on the left, captain, captain. The final syllable is reduced to schwa. Another military rank that contains a schwa. Then on, down on the right, infantry, infantry. Here we have a schwa in the middle. And finally, battalion, battalion. Here again, we can find two schwas in the first syllable and in the last syllable. And it takes some practice to learn the sound, to use it, because you have to kind of trick your mind to stop thinking about the letters as the representations of some concrete sounds because as you know in English it's very irregular and the sound might not sound in reality as you think it sounds it should sound and in the way it sounds in your head okay so you have to be open like to learn like how they are really pronounced okay I couldn't just I couldn't resist to go with a, a, a meme here okay all of us should aspire to be schwas be never stressed, always relaxed, and always be chilling. Okay, so that's should be your should be our one of our life goals to be like Schwa. Here we've got some words with silent letters, and I would like us to read those words because often they are surprising for students, and they didn't expect that those words contain sil silent letters. So we have words. Bomb, dot, dead, subtle. That was words with silent B. It really makes sense to, to repeat them after me. So take some time or pause the video to repeat them, especially if that's a surprise to you. Number two, silent L. Talk, walk. Calm, half, silent, W, answer, sword, wrestle. Okay. Here we even have like silent L at the end too, apart from W. Silent P, coup, that's because of the French origin of this word. Receipt. Pneumonia. Silent D. Handsome. Grandson. Wednesday. Silent G. Sign. Foreign. Rain. The last one is pronounced exactly as rain. Silent C. Muscle, scenario, discipline. Now, the next thing that I would like us to talk about is why it might be so difficult for us to understand movies, TV shows, and also native speakers. Because the language that we are taught uh, at school or at university in different courses, the textbook language is very different than real English. And you realize it the moment you go abroad or the moment you start speaking with foreigners that they do not really speak the way you were taught at school. They use a lot of slang. So these are words that are very informal. 
they are way more common in speaking than in writing, but people would also use that when they're texting, also reducing the words like uh, and using really informal way of speaking. Uh, another thing is a jargon that refers to some particular profession, some professional groups. For example, we would have the, it's also called the lingo. So we would have the military one. Uh, so this is like a secret club, you know, that usually just people who are the part of this group, this professional group, understand those expressions, those jokes. So that's like something very characteristic to doctors, lawyers, um, and the members of the armed forces. So that's like a kind of their secret language or just the expressions that they use of certain words. So in the military language, there, there are a lot of acronyms, for example. So the military jargon is like famous for acronyms and like excessive use of acronyms, but that's what makes it so special and fascinating. So yeah, th that's quite shocking, like when you when you are like learning the language in a language course or at school, and then you confront it with the reality, of the way people speak uh, when you're when you go abroad, when you're deployed and you meet foreigners and you realize that that's not the way people speak. Uh, so now it's time to talk about the informal contractions. As you can see, there are lots of them. Here are some examples of the contractions used in American English. And just to give you a few examples, like, of course, you can pause the video, read all of these words. I'm not going to read all of them because that's quite a lot. But just uh, a few examples like wanna, gonna, um, what else do we have here? Like Nita, mm, Easter, uh, kinda, copper, capity, capper, capity, certa, uh, a lot of, a lot of. That's why that this one is even pronounced like with with D, with the D sound. So lots of don't you, don't you, don't you there, don't you, you know, and some words, some mechanisms that we talked about, they, they all exist here and they are very informal. They're informal contractions. You can hear them in songs, you can hear them in the informal speech. Uh, do not use that in your writing. Do not even use that in your speaking exam because that's um, a speaking exam is like a semi-formal situation. So this this words might be also a little bit too informal for your speaking exam. So I would stay away just in case to be on a safe side and not use them um, in that particular situation. But in all of the, the rest of the situations that you're living, feel free to, to use them and that will make you sound more natural too. But you don't have to use them. So it's not a must. Okay. So if, for example, if you're a university teacher, and you give lectures in English, that's not the right register for you. But if you are like socializing with soldiers from other countries, like that's a very natural way of speaking for them. And it might become very natural for you too. So it's totally up to you. It's not a must, but it will make you sound more natural and sounding more like uh, a native speaker, if that's your goal. Okay, something that is worth mentioning here is the fact that you will not understand equally all the accents that we have in English. It all depends on your familiarity with the particular accent, how much exposure you had to it, and how much content you consumed or interactions you had in, in this particular um, accent. So, for example, if uh, you have been consuming um, TV series that are mostly in American English, um, watch videos of American YouTubers and so on and so forth, then probably that's the accent that you would be the most familiar with and the one that, will, that you will find the easiest to understand. Uh, 
this is, for example, my case. I find American accent the, uh, the easiest one to, to understand simply because of the exposure to it. But for some of you, uh, it might be British accent or Scottish or um, Irish accent. Maybe you lived in those countries or you worked with soldiers from those countries, then you might be more familiar with those accents and the way these people speak. So don't like, don't feel guilty and don't, don't feel bad. Like if you don't understand uh, native speakers from some countries, especially those who have like very thick accents. And trust me, like even native speakers struggle to understand them sometimes. So it's not always you, like it's sometimes just like lack of exposure to, to the language. Uh, to a certain accent, like a regional accent. So don't beat yourself up to too much for like not understanding Irish accent. If it's like the second time in your life you, you hear this accent, it takes time to get used to it, to the way people speak, the slang they use, and so on. Uh, another thing is that some people simply have really bad speaking habits. So they would speak in a really clumsy way or they would mumble. To mumble means to speak like in a very unclear way, uh, to not enunciate certain sounds and just speak in a, yeah, let's say like in a very clumsy way. And some people when they speak, they also overuse fillers, uh, which might be really distracting and annoying too. Like, uh, using uh, expressions like, you know, you know, all the time or like, um, yeah, it can get really distracting. Um, or using offensive language, cursing a lot. So this might be another factor that makes you a little bit distracted when you're trying to understand another person. So be aware of that. And remember, sometimes it's not you, it's them. So Take it easy and don't take everything so personally because really sometimes it's not you. It's there are people who have bad speaking habits. Not always, but it may happen. And okay, this is like a funny tweet that I've seen and I wanted to share it with you. I've seen it in Spanish. And I translated it for those of you who don't speak Spanish. So Spanish speakers can appreciate it in the original version. And the rest of you uh, take a look at the English translation. But I think it captures perfectly the, the essence of what is the primary goal of the exam? Listening. Because it's not to help you to facilitate understanding like it is in the real life, right? Like we have people's face expressions gestures. Also, the, the other speaker wants to help you to understand uh, the message better. But that's not the case in the exam listening. Um, so let's take a look at this tweet. If your partner tries to confuse you, speaks too fast, does not enunciate, tells you stories that you don't care about, and I would add like, and if there is like a lot of noise in the background too, like cars passing by, um, people talking in the background, it's not your partner. It's an exam listening, okay? Because all of these communication goals that are here, like confusing you, speaking really fast, not enunciating, telling you stories that you don't really care about, like this is something that you uh, confront in an exam listening because it's supposed to test you it's supposed to distract you a little bit see if you get distracted if you fall into all of these exam traps that the examiners like set up for you so you know that's the the goal of it while it's quite different in the real life communication in the everyday uh, situations be aware of that and some of us are like really good at communicating like on a daily basis, but really are really bad at tests, uh, all kinds of listening tests and exams because we 
fall into all of these distractions and traps. So be aware of that. And finally, so this is something that you can actually start doing today. Start getting familiar with IPA and connected speech. I'm going to share some resources with you that you can start with. Some videos on YouTube that I found really helpful when I was learning uh, about connected speech. So you can you can do the same. You can watch those videos and kind of raise this curiosity and start feeding it. Um, expose yourself to a variety of different accents. So do not only stick to one accent that you like and you understand the best, but challenge yourself with hearing other accents, Scottish, Irish, these are the ones, uh, Welsh, that they are like the ones that are considered challenging. And in the exam, you will hear people speaking with different accents. So in order to facilitate the whole process, like you can um, get familiar with those a little bit earlier, not when you're already taking the exam, right? Then it's too late to start uh, getting yourself familiar with the new accents. Do it earlier, do it before uh, taking the exam. Uh, the easiest way to do it is just look for some videos on YouTube, people speaking with those accents. And yeah, it's really easy nowadays to, to find those people. They're out there on the internet. So find them, listen to them. Uh, and make sure to expose yourself to speeches, interviews, monologues, group conversations, both in formal and informal context. So this will give you like a, a exposure to the variety of ways people speak, because we speak differently when we give a speech, like in a TED talk, uh, and when it's uh, an interview, when there is an interaction of two people, or when we have a group conversation. So expose yourself to all these kinds of listenings. Do not stick to one only. And a pro tip. I think this is something that made the biggest difference like in my case. It was to practice shadowing. Shadowing is this really cool technique when you hear a person speaking, for example, giving a speech, and you repeat after them. You become like a shadow of this person. Uh, and when the person says a sentence, you repeat right after them. And out loud, obviously, not in your mind. You have to do it out loud. And you can stop. Before you get into that, you can see a little bit how others do that. So check out those videos uh, from these YouTube channels, Accents Ways, uh, English with Hadar. This one is fantastic. She makes a lot of speech analysis uh, and you can repeat first with her before you start doing it on your own. And the other one is Rachel's English. She also analyzes the, the intonation, uh, speaking patterns, uh, rhythm, and other aspects of connected speech. So I would highly recommend checking, checking those channels out. And coming back to the joke that appeared at the very beginning, uh, if you didn't get it, come back to this part of the video, read it again, and I will tell you that that's about the way we pronounce phrase of apps in, uh, in the connected speech, uh, that those parts of the phrasal verb of run out of become Renata, 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 right? And so it sounds similar to Renata, to the, to the name that was used in this joke. So thank you very much for being here with me today. And, um, I would love to hear from you to get some feedback if you found this lesson to be useful, if you would like me to, to follow up. Uh, and if you have any other requests that you would like me to do the video about, feel free to contact me. Uh, you can find me on, on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active, but also on Facebook, although 
uh, I would prefer to connect with you on Instagram. And, and yeah, let's have a conversation and tell me if there is anything that I can help you with, support you with. And, and yeah, and um, have a lovely day. Um, see you next time. Take care. All the best in 2021. Bye. Mm-hmm.